The mask by feature shares its name with the mask by ambient occlusion. Both of these nodes are the same exact thing. And along with all the other mask nodes inside of Houdini, their main job is to create color that can be used to identify parts of the mesh. And once you have that attribute or once you have the areas of the mesh identified, then you can go ahead and apply other kinds of operations down the road. Uh, so as an example here, we have this pot and we have a mask by feature node plugged in. The first thing that you'll want to do is click on this visualization icon right here. You'll see that we have some red areas now showing up and that represents where the mask value is one. So as I change, let's say that the default setting here with this max angle, you could see that this begins including more and more areas based off of the direction. If we go down here, we have a section for shadows, ambient occlusion, and then towards the very bottom, some remap parameters right here. So let's say that I want to remap this directional mask, maybe give it some more contrast. We have a ramp right here, and as you can see, that will sharpen where that occurs. So we have that separately for the directional mask, the ambient occlusion mask, and the shadow mask, as well as a combined mask up here for everything in general. That's the basic layout of what we have in this node. So the directional mask is simple enough. We do have a vector option here as well as a point cloud option. And so if we have, let's say a point cloud, that will plug into this second input right here. Let me show you what happens when I have some points nearby. As you can see, it follows the point cloud just in general. Let's say though that I have this sphere along here and I have another sphere somewhere else. So we have two point clouds and one is over here and the other is over there. It will look at both of these equally. And so basically puts if the normal is facing towards these points in general within a certain angle, if it spots it, it will color the mask red. So that's what's happening here with the second input and specifically with the point cloud option right here. If you want to specify a group, we have that down here. And also this only looks at a maximum number of points. So if I set this down to let's say one point, it's still going to look at both of these spheres, but it's going to become less intense. And with less samples, the masking becomes less accurate as well as intense. So that's what's happening with these points along here. Towards the very top, we can specify what mask in particular we'd like to use. So right now I have the combined mask, which will take the direction, shadows, and ambient occlusion all in one, but we can isolate that into separate attributes depending on what kind of mask you want. So let's say that I don't want the combined mask, but I just want a ambient occlusion. Well, we can isolate that right there. And that's very useful for dialing in the exact parameters you want, as well as having separate attributes for separate occasions. So let's go ahead and calculate the ambient occlusion now. Check that on. Again, we have some samples. The higher this goes, the more accurate things get, but it's also slower. We have a bias, so as I turn that down, it's going to become less and less uh, general or less and less feathered out, I should say. And we have some blurring iterations happening. And that is just a simple blur. For those of you who don't know what ambient occlusion is, I want you to imagine all of these points sending off rays in some sort of cone like this. And if it finds something, then it's going to, in this case, reduce the value. So we can see that inside the pot, the value is zero because as rays come out from the points, it finds other areas of the mesh and that reduces the value down to zero. The reason why we're really red out here is because it's not finding any other part of the mesh. And again, that will give it that value of one, that red color. So that's what's happening with ambient occlusion in general. 
It's a really good way of emphasizing the shape of your model. And in texturing and shading, it gets used all the time for that exact purpose. If we go down here to the sampling tab, we have our cone angle, which right now is set to 90 degrees. So as I turn that down, you'll notice that it becomes less feathered out. And it, as I turn this up, let's say to 180 degrees, then it's able to find points that are, you know, parallel to this even. Uh, so feel free to turn this up as high as you need to, but the combination of all of these settings here is going to give you the ambient occlusion mask. And last but not least, we have the shadows section. If we turn this on, we have this little guy in our viewports. This is the same exact gnomon that results with the direction up here. So if you do have the direction uh, enabled as a mask, you need to share that with whatever the shadows feature is going to do. So as we change this value, we could see that these values change right here. If we want to be clever about this, we could, let's say, go to our distant lights, go to the transform, copy that parameter, and then paste as an absolute reference. So we could say paste absolute reference, and that will always follow the direction of our distant light in our scene, which is pretty cool. So the areas that are red are going to be the shadowed areas based off of that angle. And if we go down here, we have many settings to dictate the specifics of this. The samples will give us some more accurate results. The blurring iterations will blur out this mask just in general. The settings that we have down here in the sampling tab relate to how these rays are calculated. So just like before with the ambient occlusion, we do have rays traveling in our scene trying to find stuff. And if it does find stuff, then that's how it draws out the mask. In this case, if a ray hits the object and not the shadowed area, then it reduces the value. And that basically creates this red shadowed area right here. The maximum ray distance is how far those rays can go before they get killed off. So this is here to prevent a ray from traveling infinitely throughout your scene. And also keep in mind that if we take a look at this bowl right here, we should see a shadowed mask along here, but we don't. And so what you may need to do is pay attention to the thickness of your geometry. If I set this to one, nothing happens, but at point one, we all of a sudden have a shadow appearing where it should be. So again, depending on your mesh and how thick it is, you may need to reduce this ray distance so, the, so that it doesn't overshoot your mesh. This cone angle is going to feather out the edges of the shadow, but as you turn that up, you'll need more samples to get a clean border. So if I set the samples to 25 or 75 or 425, something nuts, that will give us a better border along there. And last but not least, we have this third input. And the idea is that if we plug in geometry, let's say we have a cube over here, this geometry should be able to cast a shadow onto this pot. What I found in practice is that this is a little bit temperamental. We need to first of all set a proper maximum ray distance so that it has far enough to hit the object, but then we also need to play around with this ray offset. So as we turn up this ray offset, eventually we are going to hit this cube. And again, I don't like using another object because this becomes really hard to control now, but eventually you'll hit that cube and that will be responsible for casting the shadows. So if you want another object to do that, then you need to dial in the ray offset which basically takes the rays in the direction that the light is coming from, and it starts it over here, uh, ideally behind the box. So that's what's generally happening with the ray offset. And that's just about everything you ought to know about the mask by feature node. For more videos that are thorough, simplified, and straight to the point, check out cgforge.com. 
I also offer one-on-one -on -one professional consultations, as well as mentorships that help you attain your Houdini goals more quickly. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.